I'm Dean Newland, and welcome to the Business of Intuition, where I coach, facilitate, train, and speak on the hard science and meaningful experience of intuitive leadership in business, so you can make better decisions, forge real connections, and creatively solve problems to amplify your impact and simplify your life. Welcome to the Business of Intuition. Which is often the case. Science backs up what we intuitively know. For example, we exert extra effort when we're focused and emotionally connected to another person, to a team, to our work, to our company. When focused and emotionally connected, our brains are engaged. Our superhuman powers light up and we produce beyond everybody else. When we aren't, we vote with our feet or we quit, or what some people call quiet quitting, that act of not being engaged, but still being employed. The multi-billion dollar industries of training and development, coaching, and higher education are focused in one way or another on the goal of engaging people to work to each other and to their companies. But unlike any other social species, the human brain gets tired. We are easily distracted. And we carry around a lifetime of baggage that keeps us out of the present by replaying the past and dreading a future. But what can science and even mathematics tell us about engagement? Well, my next guest has an answer. And during our fascinating conversation, we focused on three things. Number one, what causes the human brain to engage, or as he puts it, get immersed? Number two, How can we deliver training programs and presentations that are truly inspiring and engaging so people don't nod off or play with their phones out of sheer boredom? And number three, how do we design a company culture on the foundation of what creates engagement? Dr. Paul J. Zak is a professor at Claremont Graduate University and is ranked in the top 3% of most cited scientists with over 180 published papers and more than 19,000 citations to his research. Paul's two decades of research has taken him from the Pentagon to Fortune 50 boardrooms to the rainforest of Papua New Guinea. Along the way, he has helped start a number of interdisciplinary fields, including neuroeconomics, neuromanagement, and neuromarketing. He has written three general audience books and is a regular TED speaker. His newest book is Immersion, the Science of the Extraordinary and Source of Happiness. Paul is also a four-time tech entrepreneur, and his current company, Immersion Neuroscience, is a software platform that allows anyone to measure what the brain loves in real time to improve outcomes in entertainment, education and training, live events, and to help people sustain emotional wellness. He has frequently appeared in the media in such places as Good Morning America, Dr. Phil, Fox and Friends, ABC Evening News, and his work has been reported in the New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Time, The Economist, Scientific America, Fast Company, Forbes, and various podcasts. Fun fact about Paul, he is also a member of the Screen Actors Guild and has created dialogue for two movies. Dr. Paul J. Zak on the business of intuition. Paul, it's great to have you on the show. There's just a ton of stuff for us to talk about here. I think I may have told you that I found out about you through a fellow podcaster, a guy named Park Howell. And uh, he and I were coming out of a meeting where we were both supporting a CEO friend slash client of ours. I'm getting his TEDx talk ready for prime time. And he pulls me aside. He goes, Dean, you got to meet Paul. I go, why? Who's Paul? And he goes, well, he wrote this incredible book called Immersion. And he's got this several years, decades worth of science around um, how the brain gets fully immersed into things. And and it would be really helpful for you to interview him. So I'm really glad that we were able to connect on this podcast. So Paul, tell me your 30-second elevator speech. What is your research and your work really all about? Well, I'm a Martian, so I'm always trying to figure out why the humans are doing what they're doing. And if you (laughs) ask people, why did you do this? 
they kind of perseverate. They don't really know. And so 20 plus years ago, I started measuring brain activity to understand why people do what they do, and in particular, social activity. So us Martians don't understand <laughs> social activities so well. So why do we cooperate? Why do we, can we take a bunch of strangers, put them in a, in a room, and they can all work together, right? That doesn't happen for almost any other animal. Chimpanzees, who we share most of our genes with, don't do that at all. It never happens. Right. So really understanding the underlying science of cooperative behaviors allows us to then build structures to facilitate greater cooperation greater teamwork, more effective workplaces. So is the holy grail from a neuroscience perspective, serotonin, is that what we're going after here? Is that happiness drug that the brain produces? If not, correct me. No, I, uh, there's no one-to-one -one mapping. So we really want to have a suite of neurochemicals in the associated electrical activity that tells us that I have a purpose, that these people are safe, that I can actually spend time and energy to get some kind of group goal accomplished. And so that's associated with oxytocin, with dopamine, with serotonin. So again, there's trade-offs in the brain. And so okay. if I know where those trade-offs are, then I can push on ones that give me the biggest impact on brain activity and behavior. So you had mentioned in your book, Immersion, that the typical standard way in which we sort of understand people in work and in organizations is through surveys. And could you give me your point of view on surveys and why they're not always accurate? And then also maybe follow up with your approach to be able to understand where people's sweet spots are with respect to the work that they do. I'm not against surveys if I wanna sort of elicit your opinion on something. But if I ask you, Dean, why you like chocolate ice cream over vanilla, what's the answer to that? Just like it, uh, you know, that doesn't help with get as a sort of organizational theorist. It doesn't help us, right? I really want to know is what's motivating you? And, you know, when we look at people working in groups, people working in companies, it's that emotional commitment that we really want to tap into, right? That's what storytelling helps us elicit, is that yeah. emotional commitment. So if I want to ask you about your emotional state, which comes deep in parts of the brain that are not open to conscious awareness, I need a measurement technology that actually objectively and with high frequency measures that. I really want to know second by second, are you committed to this? Are you on board? Are, is this awesome or is this sucky for you? And, Man. you know, if I asked you that, you know, it's like every, every sorry, one more time. It's like every yeah. organization that we've been in, right, where there's some new person in charge to say, oh, we have this great program, you know, it's going to be awesome. And then you ask people a week later, you know, are you on board with this? And, oh, sure. And then six months later, like, oh, this sucks, right? right? So what you really want to know is, could I design this intervention so that it really taps into that emotional labor, that commitment that I'm making to the organization's goals? If I can't do that, then it's really not, it's going to fail for sure. So then how do you measure that? How do you get to that? What is your, I know you've got some tools and process and software, but tell us about that. Yeah. So we started my academic lab by measuring neurochemicals, changes in blood. So I've done about 10,000 blood drug in the last 20 years. And then once we have those neurochemicals, we can identify the areas in the brain and the peripheral nervous system that have receptors for those neurochemicals. And then eventually, because I'm a cheap bastard and neuroscience is expensive, companies started coming to us saying, hey, we want to create a better employee experience, a better customer experience, would a message more effectively. Can you do help us do that? I said, yeah, I got this hundred thousand dollar machine. I got 19 PhDs. And they said, oh man, I wait three months, right? That's not going to work. Yeah. So about five years ago, we launched a company in which we pull data from smartwatches and fitness sensors, and we can infer this neurologic state of called immersion, which is this commitment, emotional commitment to what's going on from the cranial nerves that pass through the heart. So I can use a simple fitness heart rate sensor don't care about heart rate, but I can actually, we very carefully mapped back from rhythms in the heart, very subtle changes in the rhythms of the heart to this emotional state that I've called immersion. So what is it the, so my smartwatch, if I have one, which I don't, but let's say I did, what is it, get a little bit more detail, what is it measuring? I mean, you're saying that it connects back up to the brain in some way, what is it connecting with? Yeah, so it's connecting to two primarily sorry, two primary uh, data streams coming out of the brain. One is attention. If I'm not 
attending to what's going on. I can't really commit to doing great work. I can't really cooperate effectively. And attention is associated with the brain's binding of dopamine to the prefrontal cortex. So if you think of the drugs for ADD, Ritalin, Adderall, those do that. They increase dopamine binding the prefrontal cortex, increasing your attention. But attention is just the necessary condition to get you in the door. The other thing that we found in all this published research is you've got to be emotionally committed. You've got to be on board. So yeah. attention is kind of a zero-one variable. That emotional commitment varies second by second, and that's associated with the brain's release and binding of oxytocin. And so oxytocin is this chemical that's associated with social connection, social bonding. So it's that value my brain assigns to an experience that involves other humans. And so it, does that show up in literally a pulse on my wrist? Uh, not directly. So the downstream effects of dopamine and oxytocin in the brain influence the cranial nerves. The cranial nerves are this set of nerves that are yeah. like the output file for the brain. Yeah. So I'm, Dean, I'm in the prediction business. I'm not in the, this part of your brain tissue increased 2% when you did A versus B. I don't care. I mean, I've done that research, but for this, what I want to do is create a prediction engine that takes all the output from the brain and particularly these two core data streams I just mentioned. And we've optimized those data streams. We've mathematically convolved them to maximize our predictive accuracy for things like marketing messages, the way I implement training, um, the way I communicate to customers. Okay. So let's go back to this story that I started this conversation with when I met Park Howell and I heard about you. It, this scene again was a dry run of a presentation that our friend, a friend slash CEO was, was engaged in. How could this technology, let's just say that we were the audience. Let's say there's 20 people in the room. We all have these smart watches on and we are in a sense of uh, our attention and our emotional connection to the material is being measured. Is that real time? And, can, and how do we see it? Is it something that shows up on a screen? Yeah. I mean, what's the, the feedback loop either to the audience member or to the person who's giving the presentation? Right. So sort of three innovations in this work. One is identifying this predictive set of signals that together predict what people will do after a message or an experience. The second is, as you said, doing it in real time is really hard. There's a bunch of signal processing that's got to go on because most of your brain is just keeping you alive and conscious. I know a little bit through to my voice. And then the third is putting this in a display that you can see that's real simple. So we normalize it to run zero to hundred. Everybody gets that higher is better. Yeah. Uh, so let me give you a concrete example. One of our yeah. longest term subscribers to the software platform is Accenture. Accenture spends $1 billion a year training their employees to upskill them. Yeah. Good for them. Awesome. What they found using our software is that people cannot stay immersed in training for more than 20 minutes. Yeah. So they have broken their training now down into 20 minute segments. So it's often tw no one speaks for more than 20 minutes. Yeah. And then they do a participatory task like table work for 20 minutes, no more. And then they generally do a debrief. Okay, what did the tables learn? They've also found that people need longer breaks. So this neurologic state immersion, attention and emotional resonance is metabolically costly. People get exhausted. Neurons get exhausted. Yes. So they've actually found that longer breaks uh, create more effective training. Why more effective? There's a high correlation between immersion in that session and information recall weeks later. So if that's my ROI or that's an ROI of training, that information stuck in your brain and stayed there for a couple of weeks at least, then I have a real-time measure in which potentially, not everyone does this, but uh, sometimes it's just, okay, we're done. In the K-12 space, so we have a client in the K-12 space. So kids, we're doing some, some flipped classroom table work and the teacher can actually watch the data and go, okay, you guys are done. <laughs> You're checked out, right? Everyone's yeah, kind of yeah. at low level of immersion. Let's take a break, go exercise, run around, or, or, you know, I don't know, get a drink of water, whatever that is, and then reset. And that reset can be as short as five minutes. So we sort of think because, you know, we're adults, I've been in a thousand classes like you, you got to sit there for three hours, like, we can do it. The question to me is, is it the most effective way? And so could it be a shift in just simply delivery method? For example, you've got a facilitator, they're going to go through 20 minutes of content, maybe it's PowerPoint, maybe it's 
information that's being generated from that person to the audience, and then 20 minutes of table activities and so forth. Are, are you talking about that kind of change in modality, or do we really need to stop, everybody go, walk around, get some sort of physical activity going, go to the restroom? Tell me about the, that, that ratio of how much time we need to be spending. Is it a shift of modalities, or is it a literal break? Awesome question. It can be either shift in modality or okay. a break. So I really think there's three dimensions in which we can create much better training, much better experiences. The first is, are the learners ready to receive this information? So that's where the breaks come in. Uh, so we created a physiologic measure I call psychological safety, which is how comfortable you feel in this room. So as you've said, if you have to pee, if you're starving because uh, you didn't you miss breakfast, you do, you're burning neurologic capacity on those things rather than on absorbing the information. So the first is measure readiness. The second is how you structure the content. So that could be 20 minute modules that's putting in breaks. And the third, which I know you're an expert on, is delivery. If I speak in a monotone, right, that sucks. But if right. I actually put energy into the room, then I'm actually going to signal to those learners that this is important. And so, interestingly, because immersion measures the value of social experiences, that value is contagious. So if we're having, like we are right now, having a great conversation, I am spending, sending energy to you, I'm sending immersion to you, and you're sending it back to me, and now we're in sync, and this is happening. This is, you yes. know, I, my brain is turned on, like, okay, this is awesome. I'm in. All right, so I, I want, okay, but my brain is immersing in many different ways right now. Um, what about a situation that I'm going to go off the reservation a little bit here where I have some news that I need to deliver to somebody that is not positive. You know, it's performance issue. I've got, I've got to engage in conflict and we would say conflict might be something that a lot of people will repel from, right. And, and feel the discomfort in, is there a way to do conflict that ties into some of this research that keeps people engaged versus fight or flight. Right. So, uh, yes, that's a great question. So the nice thing about having a software platform is people use it for all kinds of purposes that I hadn't thought about. And we have people who have looked at that one-on-one -on -one kind of coaching or conflict resolution. So what they found is that you want to have a quiet space. So I don't want to do this publicly. I want to have this discussion in private. Hey, Bob, can you come to my office? And we got a couple of things we should cover. All right, cool. How are you? Everything okay? So I want to create this kind of readiness to absorb this information. Say, hey, here's some things we've talked about that seems to be missing. So not yelling, not right, very factual. If you're the person giving the bad news, you want to prepare for that, right? In a very calm way. And then understand that that's going to be, you know, you know, physiologically uncomfortable for the other person as well. So I like to rehearse when I do this. Yeah. I, these are awful conversations to have, right? No one really likes to have this. So right. I will actually rehearse and have a little, you know, kind of set of notes. I, I won't look at it when I'm talking to the person, but kind of say, okay, I've got to cover A, B, and C. So I've kind of rehearsed that. I'm a big believer in prepping before these difficult meetings, just like you wouldn't go into a board meeting or a, a town hall with your employees and just go wing it. I don't know. Some seems like the, the, the company is doing okay. You would never do that, right? So right, right. if it's a difficult conversation, is really be concrete, focus on exactly the action items that the person needs to take, and then try to generate a commitment to those action items. So, right, here's what we need to do. You've been missing your sales goals for the last five weeks. You know, we had you take some online courses, and it seems like this is not really working that well. So let's talk about some solutions. One is, you know, you're just not set up for sales. The second is, we haven't given you sufficient training. Um, the third is maybe it's time to look for a different job. So, you know, let's talk about all three of those. Got it. Okay, good. All right. I, I wanted to get that out of my brains because I knew it was going to bother me for a while here. And so let's go back to the, 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 the prior conversation. So if I'm giving a presentation, are there certain tips and tools? Because I know that you have done some amazing TEDx work and you've got one out there that I saw that was just phenomenal that you had everybody hug each other at the end, which has just been I know like, well, this they went did viral. That spontaneously. Yeah, that was a TED Global, right? Oh, yeah, that was fantastic. I and mean, congratulations on that. 
Thank you. The uh, the question is then, then what what can a present a presenter do? Let's assume that they've got no more than twenty minutes because we you know we can't hold people's attention for more than that. Right. Are there certain sort of telltale tips that we should employ or deploy in order to keep people engaged in a more uh, I have the information, I'm imparting it to you. <laughs> a one-way street. It's, it's not not back and forth. What kind of things can I do in my talk that make it more engaging? Perfect. And I want to answer that question from a data perspective. So as yeah. you know, we measured immersion in TED Talks. And by the way, I'm the worst person to go with TED, to TED with because as I've given so many talks, I sit there, I'm sure that you are too, and you watch the talk, you go, oh my God, this guy buried the lead. So the first thing is you've got it open hot. Remember, your brain is mm. wants to kind of idle, right? So we call this homeostasis. I want to just idle. Now, if you open hot, like you, you shock that brain awake and go, okay. So the first response is the attentional response. So lead hard, right? Don't bury the lead. Lead with the most important thing. So many talks are chronological, which is not the lead. If you think of a great novel, even great narrative nonfiction, you start with the most important thing, right? Holy crap, I was up in a helicopter and the engine shut off and we're at 10,000 feet with my wife and my two kids. Oh shit, okay, what? Yeah, Wait, yeah I'm like, caught. okay, what the hell? And you're yeah. here, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so I was at uh, the TED conference uh, in April in Vancouver just recently and they had a very last minute speaker who was an uh, Af Afghan American physician who two days before had escaped he was he was negotiated out of a Afghan prison that he had been in for six months. Wow! So you that's the lead. Wow! As opposed to saying, "I'm from Kansas City. I'm Afghani American. I went to Afghan Afghanistan to help out with their reconstruction." No, two days ago, I the U.S. government negotiated my release after six months of torture in an Afghan prison. Holy wow. shit, I want to hear this story, right? right? So first is open hot. And the second is, our friend Park Howell has discovered this on his own, which yeah. is that narrative arc is the most effective way to keep someone immersed. So once you have that hot open, tell me a story that develops characters, that has mystery, that has real emotion. And this needs to be a story at human scale. Not that there are 100,000 people illegally detained in Afghan prisons, but I was detained. I was tortured, or he and, or she was tortured, right? That human scale story that we can really understand. I think it was Stalin who said, you know, one death is a tragedy and a million deaths is a statistic. Oh, she's it's, yeah. it's an awful statement, but it's kind of yeah. true, right? We just don't have the capacity to understand a million people dying, but we do have the capacity to think of the suffering of a single person. And then use that narrative arc and then resolve that. I think for a TED Talk in particular, and for many corporate talks, you do want to have a call to action at the end, right? So once you've immersed someone, it also means you can move them, you can affect their behavior. And that call to action should be, as an I did, touch someone, show someone love that you don't know, connect to that other person, I'll show you how in my TED Talk. So if there's one takeaway and at most two, here's the one thing I need you to do after this talk. Right? Mm. That's amazing. And they're like, okay, yes. you captured me. I'm emotionally committed. And now you want me to do something. This is why immersion also drives sales, you know, in advertising and in person, but also motivates employees. It's it's part of our human nature that, you know, I'm just not going to release these neurochemicals. My brain's too lazy unless you give me a really good reason to do it. So give me a damn good reason, right? Get, get me excited <laughs> about this. I will yeah. do it. I'm a social creature. I want to be in my community. I want to be in my social group. But you've got to actually, as a leader, as a team member, you someone's got to take control of this and say, hey, this is the purpose. This is why it's important. And these are your our teammates. These are people you can trust. These are people you can depend on. Let's do this damn thing. Let's, let's do it. So then how do you scale this? This is great. How do you scale this to a culture? How do you create an immersive <laughs> culture? What are some of the tips and tools? I know that your book, you talk about psychological safety. Maybe that's a place to start. But how do we do this? How do we create a standard operating procedure for this level engagement? First of all, it's difficult and I don't have all the answers. So let's be yeah. clear on that. But the first is, as you said, establishing this, this is a safe space. These are my friends, particularly now that we have hybrid work, we have people moving around, everyone's not in the office every day. That in-person 
you know, interaction has higher bandwidth. So really meeting in person is very important. So maybe not every day, but, or if you're a leader going to different offices, people need to spend time with you. So first is establish this psychological safety. It's safe here. The second is once you have psychological safety, building trust, that's building social relationships. So I used to be a real skeptic before I started doing this work years ago of these, we're going to take the company whitewater rafting or something. Oh yeah, it turns out that moderate stress with people that you feel comfortable with is a very effective bonding mechanism. Mm. Just like project work, like we have this big project, it's they're paying us a ton of money, we got two months to do it, we got to get on this thing. Okay, we're on, right? I'm not thinking about checking my social media, like, okay, my team needs me, this is important, this is important for our organization, for our community. So really having those challenge goals is really valuable way to bond people together. And then- Get rid of the BS, right? So people will talk. And if we don't know where we're going, what the goals are, what the milestones are, there's uncertainty around that. That inhibits our ability to really be fully committed to what's going on. So having that clear sense of where we're going and feedback. I'm a big believer in the in the daily huddle. I don't know about you, Dean, but and then, um, I just do three questions. What'd you guys do yesterday? What's your plan today? What can I help you with? That's all I really need to know, right? Everything else I'll see in some spreadsheet or, you know, I'll, I'll see the, the physical progress. But from a human perspective, are you stuck on something, right? Where are we at? And yeah, how do I jump in? So I'm a big believer in the kind of inverted pyramid, right? It's, it's the people on the bottom who are creating value. So my job as a leader is to be of service to them, to help them be more productive. And also, by the way, to be more satisfied. Oh yeah, for these employees, you get a lot of job satisfaction when you do something hard and important. So let's help people do that. Yeah, I saw a person or I had a person on the talk a while back over on this uh, this uh, podcast was talking about a study. I, I can't remember the name of it, but it was a 10-year study. It was talking about basically two different types of change management. One was top-down, which he said most of us use all the time. Management decides to do something to try to cascade it out. Basically, he said that the, the best way to use a top-down change management process was when it came to economic change, structural changes because of the vantage point that the leaders had. But when it came to culture, when it came to process, came to procedures, that kind of change happens bottom up. And I think it kind of reflects back to what you're saying is that these are the people who are the front lines. Let's get them engaged because that's where the work really is happening in many cases. You mentioned in your book autonomy as being one of the things that people really are attracted to. They want to be able to be autonomous with the work in which they do without a micromanager breathing down their back. And I know Daniel Pink in his book, you know, Drive and his great TED Talk talks about autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So could you get into maybe how autonomy can live effectively within an organization, but also has accountability as well? How do you marry yeah. accountability with autonomy? Because I think some people will go out there and say, I don't want to give autonomy to all my people because I don't think that I can trust them enough that they're going to do the work they're supposed to do. How do I hold them accountable? So can you find a way to marry those two in, way, in a way that's effective? Yeah. So I, the, the short way I explain that is to train extensively and then delegate generously, right? Mm. So I want to give you more and more opportunity to own you know, what you're doing. So when you have people who are making decisions, again, with that daily check-in, it may sometimes more than once check-in, I want to make sure you're hitting milestones, so real clear, concrete goals, and then allow people to make mistakes. Wait, mistakes? We can't make mistakes. Well, mistakes yeah. on the positive side are called innovations, right? Some mistakes right. on the negative side means you know we've lost some time or money. So that's where that where that leadership check in comes in. But I want you to do this. You're on the ground. You you know this process. You've been trained. You've done it before. Um, you and your team are going to do this project, and you should innovate because each project will be slightly different, right? If I'm you know building a twenty four hundred square foot building versus a twenty four thousand square foot building. Maybe this, you know, I, it doesn't scale exactly, right? There's going to be a little differences there. And so if you're a pro, you should know how to do that. The architects, the, the guy in the construction crew. Um, but I want to check in, right? I want to make sure, hey, do we have all the electrical in the right place, plumbing in the right place? Let's make sure we're doing that. But I want to give you discretion, right? So if you have discretion, if you have ownership, then people actually commit more. And that's what we see neurologically in the data is that the term of psychology is locus of control. When you have locus of control, you feel like, oh, yeah. I'm in charge of my life. I'm not being micromanaged. And as you know, Dean, you know, 
most people quit their jobs. I think two thirds of them in surveys say people quit the jobs because they hate their boss or basically dislike their boss. It's right. not money. It's like, man, this, this guy's a jerk or he's yeah, trying to pull my strings. So again, from a leadership perspective, I want to have a lot of feedback. I don't want to wait three months to give you feedback. I like the daily feedback or even more than daily. That's not micromanaging. Is everything going okay? Or can you send this to me or blah, 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 you know? And even in my group, when we are working on projects, we'll have a project lead. So he or she is going to build a team around himself or herself. But we'll swap that out. If we're not, if we're not hitting milestones, like, okay, we got to switch things up. Let's just swap that lead out, right? So it's really allowing them to have that positive innovation and then celebrate. When you're done, you guys killed it. Like, let's celebrate yes. and let's discuss how you did it. What did we learn from this experience that we can share with the rest of the company? Where's best, best practice come from? Yeah. So again, that's, that's, a, that's a small scale solution. So your question was, how do we scale this? So the data show that, I mean, it looks like teams bigger than about 15 start to kind of degrade in terms of each individual's contribution to the goal. So it's really keeping teams small, having them be flexible. Um, Google does this, right? Google, the average uh, team is together for three weeks. So they actually want to uh, add some chaos in. They want to add some new blood and then have people move around and reform and get some fresh ideas. But you can only do that three week, four week. If you have very clear goals, you know where you're going and you've got a manager who, again, is, is a servant leader who's trying to facilitate people doing this work. So you're talking about structure now and in terms of teams and how many people are on a team and you're mentioning three weeks and so forth. That sounds like that's a structure that's based around projects versus around function. Meaning right. like I'm part of the HR team. We're going to be doing these things over and over again. We've got payroll. We've got compensation. We've got all these other things. But I stay on that team maybe for the rest of my career. What you're suggesting is focusing your team structure regarding projects versus function. Am I correct? That's correct. And that's also a, a change in thought, right? That we think of function rather than projects. Right. But it could be, again, this kind of cross-training, which I'm a big believer in. If you're in HR, hey, I'm going to have you work, train you, and have you work in the payroll group for a while. And then I'm going to move you over to compensation, not because... You suck at payroll, I mean, hopefully not, but because I want you to get cross-trained in that. So now I've got more flexibility. That employee is growing. He or she is being invested in from the company's person. I'm going to invest in additional training. I'm going to train you now to be our, our right. benefits person or right. one of our benefits people. But think of the flexibility. So again, if you look at young people, they really want to have not only a good salary, but they want to have that opportunity for growth within the company. To give you another concrete example real quick. I did some work with AIG on their turnaround, which is amazing, you know, biggest yeah. bailout in U.S. history. And they have a claims unit in which they had 100% annual turnover. So, wow. okay, well, that's a problem. I say we hire these people right out of college. They train them up for, I think, three weeks or four weeks. And they're on the phones doing property and casualty. So if you call with property and casualty insurance, you've had the worst, almost the worst day of your life, right? Your building yeah. blew up, whatever. And they just got burnt out and said, well, that's a problem. That's an employee experience problem. So let's think about what these people need. They need um, a, a coach. They need someone to tell them where they're going. They need a very clear professional ladder. Like, how do I develop my career at AIG? Um, they need to be cross-trained. You want to be, they said, well, you got to be on the phones for a, a year before you can move up in the next thing. Why a year? Why is 365 days special about anything, right? So think yeah. about investing in them. And they're, the guy who ran this at the time, their response was, we don't invest in them because they don't stay. Well, <laughs> chicken the egg, egg, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So <laughs> said, at least as, a, and a, as an experiment, take one division in claims and just try this, right? You, you're losing money every year anyway, trying to hire and train people. Why not take one city where you have a thousand claims people and just try some different things? I really think you're onto something there. I know there's another, I don't mean to be name dropping, but there's another great book out there on team development and team structure called The Wisdom of Teams by a, a Harvard Business Review uh, author and professor at Harvard called uh, John Kotzenbach. And he talks about the same thing where the highest performing teams are small, seven to 15, no more than, and everybody has a clear understanding of how they mutually are accountable for a common goal. And it's usually the common goal is the thing that helps really define the kind of team that you are. You mentioned in your book, though, Paul, that about job 
matching, I think is the term or, or crafting. It's, it's that ability to find out what's the sweet spot. What is it that makes a person engaged? And can we then put them into a role that they can be engaged most of the time? Because it's a, it's a match. It's a marriage. I love doing this work. Ergo, the job that I am will let me do that. So my question is, in, a, in, a, in an economy that always is going to be fluctuating with labor shortages and so forth, the pessimist in me would say, that sounds fantastic. But the reality is I may have to put people in jobs that maybe they don't love to do just because I don't have enough people to do basics, right? Then. And then you add this other layer around your conversation around Cross training. You're going to be on this team for three weeks, and then another team for another four weeks, and so forth. You will be around. Um, some of that work in which they might be doing may not be the the highest and best calling. It may be yes, I've got the experience of being a claims adjuster, but what I really want to do is sales. Right, that's my that's passion. Right. So then, how do we how do we resolve for what I love to do and what I'm being trained to do that may not be what I love to do? Right. It's a great question. So let's set the stage first. We're out okay. of humans. Can we agree we're out of humans? Birth rates are very low. We've yep. we passed the echo of the baby boom. Yep. We're historically low unemployment rates. Yep. Um, and this is true in Europe. This is true in Mexico. This is true almost everywhere but Africa. And Africa will run out of humans pretty soon. So if I have humans working for me, I want them to continue to work for me. And then secondarily, importantly, I want them to be productive and, and satisfied. So that's the stage. Yes. The next step is, how do I as an employee know what I love doing? Well, I could try a bunch of things. As you said, that's costly from the company's perspective. Hopefully some people can do that. But I think the question here is measurement. So we have companies using the immersion platform while employees work. So employees can see, they can just match their calendar to their immersion levels and see, hey, every day from three to five, I am totally turned on. My brain is happening. What am I doing for three to five? Oh, I'm doing sales calls or I'm d- doing ch- uh, checking in with my employees or whatever I'm doing. So that can optimize the kind of training I for individuals so that they have a sense of professional development sure. and it gives them a reason to stay with a company, but it's a very efficient, as opposed to giving you pick some training. It's like when you were in college, Dean, right? I had the weirdest classes, one-off classes in the liberal arts education that I just loved. I would never take a second class, but I just loved it. But I don't know. You don't know what you love till you experience it. And so this is a way to figure out if I, since we all have multiple tasks or most of us at work, what part of that do I really love? And or if I'm going to cross train to some other area, how much do I like it? It's like, you know, asking me how much I like my kids or my Forget my kids, they talk back to me. My dog is laying down here next to me. My dog is perfect. Yeah. Like how much do I love my job versus, i sorry, my dog versus what I do at my job? It's not comparable on a survey. So now we're back to the survey bias. Course, yeah. I yeah, know. Right. I, it, you're asking me about my emotional response that I really don't have insight into. So anyway, I think uh. it's an interesting application of what I call distributed neuroscience. That given this technology that pulls data from smartwatches that people already own, they... Because the war for talent has been won by talent. They, the talent, can begin to go, hey, boss, I work here. I like working here. I discovered that I really like accounting, right? I don't know. I don't like talking to people so much, but the accounting stuff's great. So if, I, if you can give me more accounting and give someone else who loves more sales, more sales, that'd be awesome. So it really empowers employees, in my view. So with this cross-pollination of teams, you know, moving from one team to another over a period of three weeks be something that would be ongoing? Or would it be a way to sort of figure out where people are most effective, most engaged, and, and maybe do it every once in a while, but not make it a consistent thing? I think the Google response is probably, or Google approach is probably too uh, radical. So Facebook has a thing for their developers in which one workday a month, you can work with a different group just to try it out. That seems to be much more reasonable. And again, for smaller companies, people are doing multiple jobs anyway. And so you don't really need to institutionalize this. But yeah, I think once in a while, go meet this other group, go see where you fit. Um, So I really want to keep these employees curious, engaged, learning, growing to the extent they are. 
By the way, I had the same by academic office. I had the same secretary for like 20 years. Loved her. She was great. She just did her job. She, and I would ask her when I evaluate, like, do, do you want to do something different? Are you bored of this job? She goes, no, I got grandkids. I like, I have hobbies yeah. and I work eight to five. And she was absolutely perfect. And right. so, yeah, if you're perfect in that job, stay in that job. I, you don't need to grow. Not everybody does. And particularly growth is much more important to younger people, additional growth within the professional realm. Right. But even the personal realm. In, in my previous book, Trust Factor, <laughs> I talked really about the three dimensions of growth, which is professional growth, personal growth, and for lack of a better word, spiritual growth. So uh, besides work and family, what else turns you on? Are you a sailor? Are you a mountain climber? That's a kind of, I don't have a good word for that. Transcendent growth, maybe something, you know, uh, you're, you're adding some value to the planet. You're doing something awesome. You're yeah. involved with other people doing something cool. So I think having those larger discussions with employees, now that the war for talent is over, is really important. Let's talk about your professional growth, but how's your family doing? Yeah. Do you have time? Do you have a hobby? Do you have something besides work and family? Um, people just ask me, like, if I had a hobby, like on podcasts like this, when my kids were little, I'm like, I got two jobs and little children. No, I have no hobbies. I don't have time for yeah. that. <laughs> but my kids are older now, and now I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm developing hobbies, things I like to do, which I think actually makes me a happier person, but certainly makes me... I think a more well-rounded person because I'm not just work, family, work, family, right? I have something else I'm contributing right. to my own sense of well-being, but also I'm doing those hobbies with other people in general. So um, Paul, I want to kind of not necessarily end hot, like we had talked about with a TED Talk, you know, you'd start hot, but I would love to hear any sort of personal story about how this research and this work that you've devoted so much of your professional career to has changed you as a person? What a good question. I can think of a two dishonest answers, one, one less dishonest than the other. One <laughs> is that by looking at productivity now for about 50,000 people, um, including psychiatric patients, criminals, I'm completely tolerant to human weirdness. So we have about 200 neurochemicals that our brain sloshes around in. And it means that anybody that you work with occasionally is going to have bad days for reasons they probably don't even understand. Because they're tired, because their dog died, because I don't know, it's cloudy, right? And so I think I'm so much more tolerant of just people are going to be weird once in a while. Doesn't mean they're bad people. Doesn't mean they're and so we want to avoid committing what's called the fundamental attribution error. So I see Dean behaving badly towards me, even though you've always been great to me. And in my brain, I go, oh yeah, he's a jerk, right? That's a personality evaluation as opposed to, hey, Dean's probably having a bad day. Maybe yeah. he needs more support or just some space or just, you know, leave him be. So the first is the sort of tolerance. Um, the second is that I've really enjoyed going from my laboratory to creating a software platform that is of service of a greater goal, which is really helping people flourish in their lives. And by lab research was really always about that, but have a platform that works at scale, that helps employees, helps individuals from a wellness perspective, really live fulfilled lives. It is exciting to work at scale. And so I say both those are dishonest because I'm telling you, I'm giving you the wonderful version. Of well, what's the honest answer? The honest answer is that I still don't understand humans, and I'm really? still hoping that if I continue to measure people's brains, I'll somehow be a better human being myself. You started off this conversation, and you did the first time you and I talked a while ago, that you're from Mars. Now, say why you introduced yourself that way. I mean, I, I know there's the, the book about men are from Mars, women are from Venus, but who was it? referencing that or was it that were you trying to set up uh a, some attention to what you were about to say from a inquisitive perspective what is, what was the reason for that really the latter i think i'm very interested in in human beings i see them almost like an anthropologist although i want to really study their brains yeah. i just find humans absolutely fascinating in all their um, variations uh, in their activities and I'm just actually really interested in humans. So I've done work in animals, I've done work in some other areas, but 
humans are really complicated. And yeah. I think there's this old saying that all research is me search. So I'm sure that I, by saying yeah. I'm a Martian, I'm trying to just trying to figure out my own stuff, Dean, to be honest, yeah. Yeah. and just to be a slightly better human being. Um, I don't know if I've achieved that. You'll have to ask my family and friends. <laughs> but I think it is wonderful, like your work too, in which you do have people that, not friends, but like clients who go like, you totally changed my business, you changed my life. And I'm starting to get that now. And it's really absolutely the most valuable thing I can think of. But I come at it as an outsider, right? And I think that's what I mean by a Martian. If I'm an outsider, then I have, I'm not tied into a certain discipline. Right, you can be the observer in the picture, but not the object of the picture. Correct. And that yeah. is my favorite place to be, is the, the student, to be the, the na almost naive, obviously I know a bunch of stuff, but come, come in naively and just absorb as if I were a Martian. I don't know anything about your company. Just yeah. let me poke around. Let yeah. me see what I can find. Well, I, I have to say this is, uh, I am, understand your point of view. I remember somewhere in the maybe fifth or sixth year of our little company, that we were really working a lot with other organizations on developing teams. And then I realized we didn't operate like a team, <laughs> that we were not walking our own talk. You know, it's like the cobbler's kids have no shoes. It was this aha moment. And we still struggle with this, you know, even after 30 years is like that. But what I, and I am the consummate individual that when I learned something, I immediately try to think about how can I teach it or how can I translate this into a way that somebody else can understand instead of saying, what does this say about me? What does That's this me. teach me about me? You know, to your point about me search versus research. And so have you learned anything about yourself that you would hope would scale to your legacy as a human being on this planet? Yeah, a couple of years ago, I was asked by Time Magazine to write a couple par not a couple sentences on New Year's resolutions, which I'm not a fan of anyway. Okay, yeah. kind of like summarize all the work I've done. I'm a math guy, and so I I like I like simple equations, and so my my summary was what I call love plus. I think the goal in life is to add love to the world, and that means you either love your employees in the philia sense, right? Don't I'm not talking in a weird way, right? So. My goal is that every interaction I have with a human, that I'm adding more love to the planet because love is contagious, just like immersion is. And yeah. so that's what I've learned is that the best thing I can do every day is to be of service to others. I want the same thing for you, Dean. Thank you for this honor to be on with you. And I want to continue to be of service to you. And I try to end every conversation with the word service. And it kind of freaks people out a little bit, which is also weirdly enjoyable. Like, really? Like, yeah, I will be of service to you to the extent that I can. Yeah. I will help you be successful. And then I build up this giant network of people that think I'm somehow useful on the planet. That's awesome. How great is that? Truly. Right? I've been totally blessed by having this great job. My university gives me so much freedom. I've had a great career. And what I want to do now is, is to be of service to help people. What a fantastic way to close off this conversation. I wish I could talk to you, Paul. For hours on end, I really Oof. was looking forward to this discussion. And I want to ask, how can those that are listening connect to your work, whether it be your books, your, your platform? Just give us some information about that. Perfect. Thank you for asking. Uh, the book is Immersion, The Science of the Extraordinary and the Source of Happiness. So it's really about, it's a business book, but it's really about a book about being a great human being as well. You can find out more about our platform at getimmersion.com, immersion with an I, and shoot me an email. Happy to engage with anybody who has interesting questions. Well, thank you so much for your, the love that you're bringing and the, and the science behind it and the way we can uh, be more engaged with each other and in our companies and our families. I, just, uh, I think your work is extremely important and exciting, and I wish you just the best. Thanks, Dave. Thank you for listening to The Business of Intuition. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about Dean or Mission Facilitators Leadership, go to mfileadership.com. 
That's mfileadership.com.